This is the 102nd message in a series on the Christian work of Christ. And we're preaching on Christ and the gospel in the Old Testament. And uh, we have had four messages on the Great Day of Atonement. This will be the fifth. Then we will have one more final message on the Great Day of Atonement before going to our next subject, which will be Christ in the Deep, taken from the first and second chapters of the book of Jonah. So you'll be praying for us in these messages that we might be enabled to present Christ. And I feel that when this series of messages finally ended, if they ever are ended, we will have put together probably a very comprehensive statement of the things that we believe from the Word of God. So you'll be praying for these coming messages. In Leviticus chapter 16, our subject this morning is the scapegoat. And I'd like to read beginning at verse 5. And he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats for a sin offering, and one ram for a burnt offering. Verse 7. And he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. Verse 15. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people, and bring his blood within the veil. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel, and because of their transgressions in all their sins. And so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness, and there shall be no man in the, con- in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth in to make an atonement in the holy place until he come out and have made an atonement for himself and for his household and for all the congregation of Israel. And he shall go out unto the altar that is before the Lord and make an atonement for it and shall take of the blood of the bullock and of the blood of the goat and put it upon the horns of the altar round about. Verse 20 says, And when he hath made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions in all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited, and he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. And Aaron shall come into the tabernacle of the congregation, and shall put off the linen garments which he put on when he went into the holy place, and shall leave them there. Verse 26 reads, And he that let go the goat for the scapegoat shall wash his clothes, and bathe his flesh in water, and afterward come in to the camp. I'm sure you understand, uh, you should by now at least, the process of the Great Day of Atonement, and I'd like to briefly explain how these goats were offered and what they meant. From verse 5, we learned last Wednesday night the truth which regulates all of our explanations of the Great Day of Atonement. We are plainly told in verse 5 that there are two goats for one sacrifice. And if you do not get this verse plainly established in your heart, you will have trouble trying to make the two goats fit in as they should. I repeat, there were two goats chosen, two goats used to show one sacrifice. The great day of atonement was only a prophetic shadow of that greater day of atonement when the true Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, came from heaven to be offered up an acceptable sacrifice to God for the sins not of Israel, but for the sin of the whole world. 
and the two goats involved in the great day of atonement show the two-part ministry and the two-part function of the sacrifice of Christ. And I just hammer away on that because if you don't get it straight, you will try to make the two goats mean two different things. They are both Christ. Christ is that goat chosen for Jehovah. And I thank God that the lot fell upon him in an eternity past. But before the universe was created and before the foundation of the world, God, in eternal counsel with himself, chose by lot the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to take upon himself the human form and enter into a race not yet created, but a race foreknown and foreseen of God by his eternal foreknowledge. And it was Christ the Son who was chosen. It might well have been the Father, and it might well have been the Holy Spirit, but it was the beloved Son that God might demonstrate his eternal love and willingness to sacrifice even himself for the fellowship and communion and the love of his creatures. So the eternal lot fell upon the Lord Jesus Christ to be the sin offering. That first goat that was slain by the brazen altar by the high priest and whose blood was carried into the Holy of Holies in a basin and sprinkled seven times on the mercy seat was fulfilled in Jesus. He went to the brazen altar of Calvary's cross. There he was slain by the people. By the permission of God, and his blood he carried himself into the Holy of Holies on the resurrection morning, so we are taught in the scriptures. And there in that holy place he sprinkled the true mercy seat and obtained not an annual redemption or forgiveness, but an eternal redemption for the world. He fulfilled all of that work of the first ghost. And we must see that the work of the second goat he also fulfilled in the work of the cross. It is impossible to show the work of these two goats at the same time in the order of the great day of atonement. One man, the high priest, did all of the work. He dealt with the sin offering first, slain into the altar, carrying its blood while it was yet fresh, into the Holy of Holies and sprinkling it. And then he came out and washed himself and put on his garments of glory, dealt with the scapegoat and sent him away into the wilderness. In the work of the scapegoat, we have another aspect of the Lord's sacrifice. We see in the work of the scapegoat what his atoning work means to the sinner saved by grace. In the work of the sin offering, we see what it means to God. It means that by the blood of Jesus, God is satisfied. It means that by the blood of Jesus, the sanctuary is purged. It means by the blood of Jesus, sprinkled symbolically on those four horns of the altar, there was an eternal redemption obtained for the whole world. We see that by the blood of Jesus, man is reconciled to God. God is eternally satisfied, and the matter of sin is settled forever in his sight. But by the scapegoat, we see that by his being sent off unto eternal separation for us, our sins are removed, our sins are forgiven, and we have peace with God. The word scapegoat could be literally translated the goat of dismissal, the goat of removal. It was the goat chosen to be dismissed, sent off in separation for the purpose of removal. The people had to see in the work of sacrifice what God saw in the Holy of Holies. And in the work of the scapegoat, 
it was vividly portrayed the eternal removal of sin from the presence of God and from the guilty heart of the people. This goat of removal and goat of dismissal carries with him and with his word one significant fact. And this is worth remembering and even worth writing down. Whatever you think about the two goats on the great day of atonement, remember these two great facts. One, two goats show but one sacrifice, hence both are Christ. And the second great truth is this. The sin for which the first goat died are carried away on the head of the second goat. Now, I want to repeat that. The sin for which the first goat died are carried away on the head of the second goat. It means simply the sins for which Christ died. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 6, Christ died for our sins, according to the Scripture, and the sins for which he died were carried away upon him at his death. And so John the Baptist's words are fulfilled, Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. I'm trying to impress upon you that sin was not ultimately and finally dealt with by the simple fact that Christ died for them. He who dies for sins must also carry them away. He who dies with them must remove them. He who dies with these sins upon him must be dismissed from the presence of God, from the presence of the people, Yea, from the presence of the world itself, he who takes upon him by the imputation of the priest's hand those sins must carry them away and remove them to a place where they will never more be found by God or man. And this is the true dimension and the true perspective of the atoning work of the Lord Jesus Christ. You must see that merely dying at Calvary does not ultimately settle the subject of sin. He who dies for sin must remove them to a place where they can no longer be remembered against us, neither by God nor by the Holy Spirit in his convicting and purging work in our conscience. Physical death does not complete the work of atonement. It is necessary that the sins that he died for be removed by his banishment from God's presence and from man. This is seen even in the New Testament word forgiveness. The New Testament word forgiveness has a very simple meaning. It means literally to send off to take away, to remove, or to separate from. And when a man is said to have the forgiveness of sin, it means that his sins have been sent off someplace. It means that his sins have been taken away. It means his sins have been removed. It means that he has been separated from his sins. This is the New Testament word for forgiveness, and it is how we understand Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there is no sending off, no removal, no separation, no taking away of sins. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. It was necessary that the sin sacrifice die, necessary that he shed his blood. For without that shedding of blood, without that physical death with sins upon him, there can be no eternal removal, sending off, or taking away 
of those sins. The conclusion to all of this, the separation of sins, the carrying away of sin, is the result of sacrifice. And I'm at a great loss to understand how any person seriously studying the great day of atonement can escape these conclusions. I repeat it in as plain a language as I can. The sin for which that first goat died are removed and carried away and sent off on the head of the second goat. It means that there is a two-edged sword in the atoning work of Christ. It means that there was a twofold work in his redeeming work. It means that he not only died for our sins, it means that he died for our sins and took those same sins upon himself and remove them to the wilderness place from which they shall never come again to convict and condemn us. Now when it came time for the scapegoat's part, the high priest came out of the tabernacle of the congregation where he had gone in to make the atonement in the holy place, went out to the altar and sprinkled it, Reconciling the holy place of the tabernacle and the altar, he calls for the live goat. And then he does something. He lays both his hands upon the head of the live goat. And with both his hands upon the head of that goat, he confesses over him, or he agrees with God over the head of that goat, to all of the iniquities and all of the transgressions and all of the sins. And there, by a miracle, he put these sins and transgressions and iniquities upon the head of that goat. And once he puts them upon the head of that goat, it is necessary that that goat be separated from God and man forever. And he is removed and banished and exiled and separated from the place of God's communion and fellowship, and there in that wilderness place he carries off all the sins and the iniquities and the transgressions of the people. First of all, I call your attention to a, a little phrase here that may escape us, that Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat. And uh, somehow another uh, little insignificant things become significant when you think of the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, to accomplish this work in the scapegoat, there had to be the willingness of the people to identify with that sacrifice. And this identification is seen in the laying on of the hands of the priests. But it is significant to me that the Holy Spirit brings to our attention the fact that he laid both of his hands upon the head of that goat. Now the hands are those things by which we accomplish our works. We speak of the works of our hands. We speak of the fruit of our hands. We speak of doing with our hands the good things that we do. And the high priest laying both his hands upon the head of the live goat seems to me to be the testimony of God that in the Lord Jesus Christ there must be the end of all of man's effort to establish righteousness in the sight of God. All the work of his hands end at the head of his sacrifice. All of the labors of his hands come to an end when he identifies with his substitutionary atonement and his substitute table. He comes to Christ confessing, in my hand, no price I bring. He lays his empty hand, signifying the end of his search for righteousness, the end of his work for righteousness, the end of his labors for righteousness. 
He lays them upon the head of that goat, and there he confesses all his sins, his iniquities, and his transgressions. And there, brethren, those sins and iniquities and transgressions become the burden and the guilt of the Lord Jesus Christ. For there we read in this chapter, they are put upon him. There they are laid upon him. There through the empty hands upon his head. There by the act of faith they pass from guilty sinners to him. And he becomes condemned in the sight of God in their place. It's plain, isn't it? Now, before we continue to develop that, let us talk for just a moment about what was confessed over him. Maybe you'd be interested to know precisely and exactly what God has forgiven you of and what God is willing to forgive you of. Somehow or another, we have a very strange way of categorizing sin or cataloging sin. And sometimes we hear folks say that there are some sins that man can't be saved from, some sins for which there is no pardon. There is no unpardonable sin. The only sin that could even be called by such a phrase, the unpardonable sin, is the sin of rejecting, ultimately and finally, the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. There is no sin short of that could be called unpardonable. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's word says, cleanseth us from all sin. Sins of the hands, sins of the mouth, the sins of the mind, the sins of the heart, sins of thought, the sins of deed, the sins of omission, the sins of commission, the sins of the past, the sins of the present, and the sins of the future. It is just simply stated that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all. All manner of sin, the Greek says, all kind of sin, all varieties of sin. Matters not what your sin has been. Matters not what your sin is this morning. Name the most vile and corrupt and black sins of the human mind and heart and body, and I can still tell you on the authority of God's word that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. We may be purified from any sin, saved from any sin, washed from any sin, cleansed from any sin, for sins are in reality committed in the heart, and it is the heart that God looks upon man upon the outward appearance. And because man looks on the outward appearance, we judge men to be greater sinners than ourselves, or ourselves greater sinners than others. We look upon those outward signs of sin and try to size a man in regards to him being a sinner. God looks upon the heart, and looking upon the heart, he sees that we are all sinners all corrupt and all short of the glory of God and no matter what our sin has been in mind and soul and body against God for all sin is technically and primarily against him whether it be blasphemy whether it be murder whether it be adultery whether it be profanity whether it be all of the black sins of the flesh whether it be the sins of unbelief the sins of infidelity the sin of neglect the sin of omission, whatever sin it may happen to be, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses once for all, forever, from all sin known to man, and best of all, from all sin known to God. Confessed on the head of that substitute was all the iniquities of the people. Now, there are different words in the Hebrew as well as different words in the Greek, and they bear different translations in our Bible. 
for sin. Because there are different kinds of sin, but not different degree of sin. Now, this first word groups together generally under the term iniquity, a sin which is literally in the Hebrew distortion, astray, doing wrong, doing wickedly, out of course, and it simply means doing wrong going the wrong way. It is our moral corruption. It is the inability of man to do right. Call it, if you will, the sin nation. It is the natural inborn iniquity that all of us come into this world equipped with. The inability to do right. right. The consistent desire and the consistent choice to do wrong. It is this continual going astray. It is this continual turning away from right. This continual turning our backs upon righteousness and upon life. And every Christian in this hall this morning knows how evident it is yet in our hearts. And were it not for the constraint of the Holy Spirit and the restraining force of the love of Christ, we would, as the song says, be wayward still. He keeps us by his grace in the course. He keeps us by his grace going the right way. He keeps us by our grace from going astray, doing consistent wrong, and morally being perverse or twisted or warped out of the way of righteousness. It is only by the presence of Christ in us through his Holy Spirit that we have any victory whatever over this moral corruption of the sin nature. And according to the Hebrews, it was this iniquity that was laid upon the head of the scapegoat on the great day of atonement. Certainly, our continual doing wrong has been a great grievance to God. But he laid it all on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, secondly, all the transgressions of the people were laid upon his head. The word transgression means to pass over the boundary. It means to go beyond God's word and God's law. God had given certain things in his law. He said, Thou shalt and thou shalt not. And transgression is the willful choice of wrong in the face of right. This does not come from a nature. This comes from a willful, stubborn, rebellious choice on our part. We look full into the face of what God says and deliberately do wrong. We go beyond the law of God. We go past the boundaries of what God's word says and what God's word teaches. And this is labeled by the Holy Spirit as transgression. And every time we know to do right and do it not, the Bible says it is sin. And every time we know to do right and do it not, it is transgression. That is the word. And all our transgressions were confessed over the head of that scapegoat. That's good news, isn't it? And the third thing is a thing called sin. The word sin here means to miss the mark, fall short of the goal. It is to strive for a goal but to fail. First, let me go back. Our iniquities, that sin nature that makes us by nature choose wrong instead of right, those willful, rebellious acts or transgressions whereby we have deliberately violated the law of God. They were all 
confess on the head of that gun, but third, all of our efforts to be righteous, all of our efforts to be good, all of our efforts to save ourselves and establish a standing with God is considered sin. For in all of it we have failed, and all of that is also laid upon the head of the scapegoat. And maybe you never thought about Christ dying for our goodness. Yes, indeed. He died for our self-righteousness. He died for our efforts to be good. He died for our efforts to make ourselves righteous in the sight of God without him. For every man who tries by his morality, his goodness, his integrity to be accepted of God apart from sacrifice, that man has committed the worst sin of all. Paul was that kind of man before he was saved, and he called himself chief of sinners. Not only were our iniquities and our transgressions confessed upon him, I thank God our righteousnesses, which are as filthy rags, were laid upon him as well. Now, our story tells us that these sins and iniquities and transgressions were confessed over him, and then it says, putting them upon him. Now, no human being can lay his actual hands upon an actual goat's head and cause the sins and the transgressions and the iniquities of a whole nation to pass mysteriously and magically through his hands to the head of that goat. If any priest could do that, it would be quite a trick. But it can't be done. Yet the Hebrew said that they were put upon him. The priest didn't do it, and the people didn't do it, but through the power of God they were, to use a New Testament word, imputed to him counted to him or reckoned to him by that symbolic act. Now notice that they were imputed or counted or reckoned or put upon his head, and we are told that he is to be sent away where he shall bear upon him. He bears now upon himself or takes upon himself the burden and the guilt of all that was imputed or counted to him. Now, in the New Testament, Peter, speaking of the death of Christ, refers to him in this manner, who his own self bear our sin in his body on the tree. And from that simple verse in 1 Peter 2, we have the Holy Spirit's statement that when the Lord Jesus hung on the tree, our sins were in his own dear body. Now, it's a, a, a lawful question to ask how he got those sins in his own dear body. His body was incorruptible. The whole testimony of the scriptures tell us that he lived without sin, holy and harmless and undefiled. But on the cross, we are told he bears in his body our sins. How did he get them in his body? He got them in his body through something that was offered him in the Garden of Gethsemane. This which was offered to him in the Garden of Gethsemane as he met alone with God in prayer was called a cup. He saw something in that cup when the Father offered it to him that for the first time in all his life made him terrorized. He was filled with terror and so afraid that he fell upon his face crying that if there be some way for the cup to pass, God would let it pass. 
And each time he was made to look into this covetous conduct, he fell in fear and in trouble, crying out that he was greatly amazed, that he was fearful, that his soul was troubled, and so great was this fear, this terror, this trouble, that he said it was almost unto death. And so intense was his agony in the struggle that his sweat became, as it were, great drops of what? Blood. And uh, you see, the blood did not begin to be shed on the cross. The beginning of the shedding of blood began before the actual cross itself. And I think here in the garden there was something took place with that cup. Finally he received it of his father. And I'm wondering if Paul's words in Hebrews were not fulfilled that he tasted death by the grace of God for every man. He tasted it and agreed. I know he tasted it in Gethsemane, for he had said up until that time that there was nothing in physical death to be afraid of. He consistently said there should be no fear in anybody's mind of death. He said, this is what man should fear. Fear him who hath power to put both body and soul in hell. That's something Jesus said to be afraid of, and until Gethsemane he had never manifested any fear of anything, including physical death. He said, I lay down my life and take it again. Nobody can take my life if I don't want them to. He had no fear in physical death, but in Gethsemane he became afraid. And in Gethsemane he was filled with terror. And in Gethsemane, according to Hebrews 5, he prayed that God would save him out of the death he was looking into in the cross, in the cup, in Gethsemane. And God promised to save him from that death, and he received that cup. For in John 18, 11, when he was leaving the Garden of Gethsemane and was arrested, and Peter would have come to his defense and drew his sword, Jesus said, Put up your sword. The cup which my Father hath given me, shall I not drink it? He had that cup with him. He intended to drink it. He had already tasted of it to the shedding of his own blood and had known what he, by the grace of God, must experience for all men. He saw the results of the confession of the world's sin upon his head, and he went to Calvary's cross to drink that cup. This explains, in case we never get to explain it again, it explains why at that crucial hour of his sufferings, when physical thirst was the very least of his sufferings, it explains why with a loud voice he cried, I thirst. And even though they offered him drink, he refused it, signifying that he thirsted for a cup that no man could see but he and God his Father, signifying that what he longed to drink was something no man could describe or know. And in that darkness he drained that cup and throwing it aside, he cried, It is finished. And the sins that were in his body then passed upon his head at death. And the sins confessed over him became his alone to dispose of in the eternal separation to which he was sent. The sins were in his body, but at his death those same sins were put upon him. How else can we interpret Paul's words? For God, he, that is, hath made him, Christ, to be sin for us. Here he does not speak of those sins being in his body, 
He says, God made him, not his body, him, to be sin for us. And in Isaiah 53, 6, we hear God saying, He hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And I think the order in Isaiah 53 is precious. It says, first of all, notice it follows the line of Leviticus 16 in dealing with sins, iniquities, and transgressions. Here is what Isaiah says first. He was wounded for our transgressions. It says that he bore away the sin of many, and the iniquity of us all was laid on him. And you have the scapegoat perfectly fulfilled in the Gospel of Isaiah, that upon the soul of the Lord Jesus Christ, as a sin-bearer, he accepted the responsibility and the burden and the ultimate penalty of the sins, the iniquities, and the transgressions, not of a nation, of a whole race of ruined sons. So what happened to him then when he died? What happened to the scapegoat after the imputation of sins, iniquities, and transgressions? The scapegoat can only find his fulfillment in Isaiah 53. He can only find his fulfillment in the New Testament language where the sin of the world was laid upon him. And if so, what happened to that scapegoat? Was he brought into the sanctuary for the fellowship and presence of God? Oh, let me tell you something that touches my heart this morning. Once those sins and transgressions and iniquities were laid on the head of that loud goat, he was considered so unclean, so vile, and so abominable that not only was he to be sent off, and separated, never allowed to return, but the very man who took him away into the wilderness must wash and bathe and change his garments before he returned to the camp. So contagious did they consider the power of that sin that was laid upon us And to talk of the Lord Jesus, having our sins laid upon him, our sins, iniquities, and transgressions imputed to him, and to say that at Calvary he went off to the presence of the Father in peace is to contradict every plain statement of the atonement in the New Testament, as well as the Old. He went where the scapegoat went, and he went because of why the scapegoat went. He had been rendered unclean in the sight of God. He died crying as he entered that wilderness place. My God, my God, let me paraphrase it. Why hast thou sent me off? Why hast thou forsaken me? Why hast thou abandoned me? Why am I unclean now in thy sight? And his answer in Psalm 22 was, Thou art holy. And what was he? He said he was no man. He said he was a worm. Unholy, unclean, and unacceptable in the presence of God. Clothed with the filthy rag, of our righteous Nessus, clothed in the dirty garments of our transgressions and our iniquities, wrapped in the decaying flesh of a ruined race of sinners, corrupt and vile, abominable, and we have a picture of it, dear friend, in the serpent of Genesis 3, who was once of all the beasts of the field the most subtle. And according to other scripture, we have reason to believe of great beauty and of great wisdom. But this beast, who was once subtle, of great wisdom and of a great beauty, 
acceptable ones in the sight of God became a loathsome, crawling reptile under the eternal curse of a holy God. And is this not why in the wilderness God caused Moses to lift up a brazen serpent as the sign and symbol of his crucified son? He who was once beautiful and once accepted, once filled with the wisdom, the power, and the beauty of God's holiness, now changed and transformed and made by God himself into the loathsome replica of sin. This is why he must be set off. He must take away that sin. And so the priest chooses a fit man to lead this loathsome, defiled beast away into the wilderness never to return again. The word wilderness means a land cut off. It is given in a later verse here as a place not inhabited. There's some facts you just simply can't escape. One is that the wilderness represents a cut-off place, a place of separation. It represents a place where no living soul can exist, and it represents a place from which no one cent can ever return. This you cannot escape. He bears these sins and iniquities and transgressions to a literal place where they are removed from God and man forever. And if that scapegoat be fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ, we cannot escape the conclusion that at his death he who became sin for us he who was clothed in the loathsome garments of our iniquity and the filthy rags of our transgressions was sent off, separated, removed to a place God has reserved for unclean souls. That place is hell. It is referred to as the lake of fire the second death, it is spiritually called separation from God in outer darkness. And the Lord Jesus Christ was separated from his Father at the death of the cross, sent off into an uninhabited place where no living soul is today. All who are there are dead in their trespasses and sins, and all who are there have gone there with their sins upon them. And he went there. He descended, Paul says, into the deep. He went into the lower part of the earth. And as he said of his own mouth, as Jonah was three days and nights in the whale's belly, so shall I be three days and nights in the heart of the earth. He went someplace at Calvary's death with our sins, and he went to that place of eternal separation and removed them from us and, thank God, did something that the scapegoat never did. He came back. But where do we find this in Leviticus 16, that he came back? The scapegoat doesn't come back. Well, you know types. Paul says in the book of Hebrews, they're only shadows. They never can show the reality, all of the reality. Now when the shadow of a man falls across the floor, can you see his face? Can you see the lines around his eyes or the smile on his lips? No. Nor can you hear his voice. You're looking at 
what is at the very most a vague outline of that man. Now if it were the shadow of a very large man, and you knew that very large man, you might guess who it was. But shadows are indistinct. They are not clear. They only mean to give in figure the reality. And Paul warns in the book of Hebrews of trying to build doctrines on the shadow. They must be built on the realities where the truth is plainly unmasked and plainly given. Therefore, all types must stop at a certain point. If we carry them too far, we find that we have perverted the reality for the shadow. So you must start in Leviticus 16 with this. Christ is all of this chapter. He is the priest, is he not? He is the altar, is he not? He is the sacrifice, killed and his blood carried in the Holy of Holies. He is the scapegoat bearing upon his soul our sins, iniquities, and transgressions, and sent off into the wilderness place. Bless your heart, he is also the pit man, at whose hand the sin of the world was taken away. Do you know any other man who was fit to do it? Do you know any other man who could have done it? Do you know any other man who could be singled out by God from the whole world and say he is fit to remove the sin of the world into the wilderness. Christ was that fit man, and at his hand he took the sin of the world into the wilderness, and that fit man did come back. But when that fit man came, before he came back to the presence of God and to the presence of the people, he bathed and cleansed himself and changed his clothes. No wonder the disciples had peace when they saw the Lord in the upper room. He had bathed and he had cleansed himself and he was pure and undefiled and glorified and apart from sin. He had returned from the wilderness place and sin had been separated forever from God and from man. I'd like for you to look at Psalm 32, and I just read a few verses of Scripture as we close. Verse 1 and 2, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. This passage is quoted in the book of Romans. It is quoted by the Apostle Paul, and he teaches that it was fulfilled in the atoning work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who are sheltered by the work of that blessed substitute can never again have iniquity imputed or charged or reckoned to their account. Their sins are covered, and the Greek in Romans 4 says, and remain covered forever. They have been removed satisfactorily from the presence of God and from the presence and guilt of man. If you'll turn to Psalm 103, verse 10 to 12. He hath not dealt with us after our sins. Why? Because he dealt with his substitute after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquity. Why? For he rewarded Christ according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. And as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Isaiah 38, 7. 
And notice that in that passage in Psalm 103, sins, iniquities, and transgressions are all dealt with there again. You see that appearing again? He didn't deal with us according to our sins. He didn't reward us according to our iniquities and our transgressions he hath removed. Isaiah 38, 17. Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption, for thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. What happened to our soul? Our soul was delivered from the pit of corruption, but he was not delivered from the pit of corruption. He was delivered to the pit of corruption that we might be delivered from it. All our sins were cast behind the back of God when Christ saw the back of his Father at the cross and cried, My God, why hast thou forsaken me? Notice Isaiah 44, 22. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. He has blotted out our transgressions and our sins because of that blessed one, who, like a blotter, absorbed our sins and our transgressions. Isaiah 43, 25 reads, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake, and I will not remember their sins. Now if you'll look in uh, Hebrews 10 for just a moment. Verse 17, And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission, or sending forth, or separating or removing of these, that is, sin is, there is no more offering for sin. And I close with one observation. The proof that a man has really rested in the atoning, finished, redemptive work of Christ is simply this. He stands assured in his soul that his sins and his iniquities are remembered no more, that they are remitted, forgiven, sent forth, carried off, laid aside, pardoned, taken away, separated from him forever, and the proof that he believes all of that and is assured of all of that is that he never again makes an offering for sin. He never again accepts Christ as his Savior he never again goes back to the altar, and he never again tries to get saved. He is saved, he has been saved, he will be saved, and knows that he is saved for an eternity. For he has seen his scapegoat depart into the wilderness, and he knows that when the sick man came back, the sins were gone. Let us pray. Thank you, Father, for thy word, for the clarity of thy word. Pray that thou would use it in our hearts. Convict those who have never rested in Jesus, that they might, with all their hearts, come to rest in him. Bless those who have rested in Jesus, that their hearts might be encouraged and blessed by this word. For we ask it all in Jesus' precious name and for his sake. Amen. Lord bless you.